Hi folks, I'm back. Today I'm going to be going over Esther chapter 3. But before I do, let me pray. Dear Father, Father, I just thank you for letting me teach your word. Father, I just ask, Father, that you just give me your wisdom, Father, to bring forth your word with clarity. Father, I just ask you that you just let me decrease and you increase. Father, I just ask that you just give people... Um, uh, I just ask that you just give people receiving hearts and minds. I just ask that you just stir up people's spirits, Father. Give them a fervor, Father, to want to study your word, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin chapter 3, let me do just a slight review of uh, chapter 2. So last week we studied chapter 2. King Ahasuerus had issued a decree that would take, um, that would dis dispose of Vashti being on the throne. See, and he called for a, wow, what do you want to call it? Nationwide? Kingdom-wide. He called for a kingdom-wide um, decree that commanded all women to come to Shushan Palace where a beauty contest was going to be held. And this contest was going to determine who the next queen was going to be since Vashti, King Ahasuerus' uh, wife, was out of the picture because in chapter 1, she refused to come to the banqueting hall dressed in only her crown. She wasn't dressed, she wouldn't have been dressed in anything else. She would have gone into the bank, she would have gone into the banqueting hall completely naked except for her queen's crown. Well, I believe this had happened many times before and she just got tired of being the showcase trophy wife. So she refused her husband's order to come to the banqueting hall. So the king called for a call for all the women from every province that was under his control, 127 provinces, he called for all the women in all these provinces to come to Shushan Palace. And one of those women was Esther, who would be his future wife. So now, let's go on to chapter 3 because the story is going to become very interesting now. After these things, King Yehaziwares promoted Haman, the son of Adatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were, who were within the king's gate, bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai, by the way, Mordecai is Esther's uncle. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? The com command. Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told him that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. 
but he disdained to lay his hands on Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Did, did, do you know why Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman? In this culture, like as in the Babylonian culture, the Assyrian culture, the Egyptian culture, anyone who was a high-ranking official, the king and his second-in-command, I believe that's what Haman is here, second-in-command, anyone that was a really high rank in the king's court, you had to pop, bow down to that person and pay them homage as if he were a god. That's why Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman because Mordecai knew, well, why do I need to bow down to this guy? He's just a mere man. I only bow down to one person the God of the universe. That's why Haman was full of wrath because Mordecai would not give him that type of, would not pay him that type of homage and bow down to him like as if he were a God. So Haman not only set out to destroy Mor uh, Mordecai but he set out to destroy all the people of Mordecai. D does this sound familiar to you folks? Who also tried to destroy all the Jews? His name was Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler honestly believed that when he started destroying the Jews when he started annihilating them during the Holocaust, he honestly thought he was picking up where Haman left off. And not only that, but he vowed he was going to succeed where Haman failed. See, Haman wasn't able to carry out his plans. Now Hitler did manage to implement his plans. The Holocaust, the Holocaust started in 1942. Except, just like Haman, Hitler also failed. And there's one reason that both of these men failed. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Both men were a curse to Israel for going after them to try to destroy them. That's why they both failed. So let's go on. Verse 7. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Uhazuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Verse 8. Notice what Haman says here to the king. Then Haman said to the king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Notice, he doesn't say who these people are. He says, there's just this group of people. Their laws are different from all other peoples and they do not keep the king's law. What a twisted lie. Therefore, 
It is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that, now get this, that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it to the king's treasures. Now look, so here we go. Here's the beginning of, of Haman's plot. Not only did he lie about the Jewish people, but he's asking the king to write a decree to make it legal to destroy these people. Let me share something with you. You know today, there's two groups of people, very evil people, that are trying to do the very same thing. One group is called BDS, the Boycott, Divest, and Sanction Group, and the other one is the Students for Justice of Palestine. Everything these people believe in is based on twisted lies, just like Haman is doing right here. You know what, folks? The devil has never stopped trying to destroy Israel. From the time of Abraham all the way up to the present, he has tried one tactic after another to, to, to uh, try to destroy Israel for this one reason. If the devil could succeed in destroying Israel, it would totally discredit the Bible because God's word says, Israel shall remain forever. And think about this too, folks. If Israel were destroyed Jesus never would have been born because he wouldn't have been coming unto his own people he wouldn't have been coming unto his own nation if there was no Israel and if Israel's destroyed Jesus won't be able to set up his eternal kingdom here on earth because that's where he's going to set it up in in the nation of Israel so yes, the devil tries time and time and time again to destroy not only the people of Israel, but the nation of Israel. And he raises up groups like the BDS movement and the Students for Justice of Palestine, both who claim they're not anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist groups, which is another lie because they are. But he raises these groups up and then he allows them to infiltrate onto college and university campuses where they go and spread their, their hateful doctrine, poisoning the minds of these college and university students to get them to turn against Israel. Let me read you what these groups are all about. This is what the BDS movement is all about. So the B in BDS means boycotts. It involves withdrawing support from Israel's apartheid regime. Israel is not an apartheid nation. That is a twisted lie, just like what Haman is doing right here. Same lie never changes. Um... 
They can't they accomplish uh, Israel's sporting culture and academic institutions. In other words, they infiltrate. They infiltrate all of this. And from all Israeli and international campaigns engaged in violation of Palestinian rights. So, um, they they, they they try to force people to withdraw su supporting Israel through through boycotts. You know, Hitler did the same thing in 1934, in April of 1934. You see, when Hitler came into power in 1933, one of the first things that he did was begin his war against the Jews. Did you hear me, folks? Hitler was warring against the Jews. He wasn't warring against them with weapons of warfare. He was warring against them by bringing laws, sanctions, anything you can imagine. He was warring against these people to utterly destroy them. And his, the final weapon he drew out to destroy these people was the final solution, which began in 1942. So, but in 1934, Hitler called for a statewide, remember, Hitler had not conquered any European nations up to this point, because World War II had not started yet. So this boycott he called for in 1934 only happened in Germany. Now, it, it was largely a failure, but it sent a message to the Jewish community that they would not be safe anywhere in Europe from Hitler's grasp. And indeed, they were not. They were not safe anywhere. As Hitler's tentacles spread out over Europe and he conquered one European nation after another, similar anti-Semitic laws were passed. And with the exception of Switzerland, Denmark, and Sweden, and I think Spain too, uh, because they were they were all neutral. None of those countries gave up their Jews, but all the rest of them did. Poland sacrificed three million. Denmark, my hat's off to Denmark. They saved every single one of them, every single Jew, seventy-five hundred people. In 1943, 7,000 Jewish individuals were taken across the Orsund to Sweden where they stayed for the remainder of the war. Unfortunately, 500 people were captured by the Nazis, except, and they were taken to Thresenstadt, deportation center in Czechoslovakia. Except this is what happened. The Danish government sent emissaries every month to Thresenstadt to make sure that those 500 people that were captured were not harmed and that they were all right. And they also brought them care packages. And when the war was over, all 7,500 people came back. Their houses were taken care of. Their businesses were taken care of. Nothing, nothing was looted. Nothing was destroyed. Everything was as it was when they left. What a difference between Poland and a lot of other European nations 
who just gave in to Hitler's demands and turned over their Jews for annihilation. It's a shame, folks. It's a shame. So the word divestment. Campaigns urge banks, local councils, churches, pension funds, and universities to withdraw investments from the State of Israel and all Israel and international companies that sustain Israeli apartheid. Again, it's a lie, folks. There is no apartheid in Israel. These people, they're so twisted, so devilish in their thinking. See, what they're trying to do, do through BDS is they're trying to ruin Israel's economy. They think if they can just ruin Israel's economy, that will cause the nation to be destroyed. Well, I got news for you. Read Isaiah 11, 11. God says he's going to stretch forth his hand a second time and bring his people back from all four corners of the earth. So when did that happen? When did the second time God regather his people happen? On May 14, 1948. The first time happened in 586 B.C., when the, uh, the, the Israelis went into Babylonian captivity and they came back 70 years later. You can read about those exploits in the book of Nehemiah and uh, Ezra. And then they came back for a second time in 1948 after almost 2,000 year exile and when God says twice folks he means twice if God did not want Israel to be there why are they there right now the simple truth is because God wants them there because God has a plan and purpose for Israel like he has one for us so no matter what the enemy does here to try to destroy Israel, it will never, ever succeed. They didn't, they didn't succeed in 48, 67, 73, and they haven't succeeded beyond 73. They're still there. So all this nonsense that these people, BDS, are saying, that's all it is, folks. It's devilish nonsense from the pit of hell. Sanctions. Campaigns pressure governments. Yeah, they do. To fulfill their legal obligations to end Israeli apartheid. See how many times they bring that word up? Apartheid, and I'm going to tell you over and over again, it's a lie. And not aid or assist or... Um, and not aid or assist its maintenance yep. by banning businesses with illegal Israeli settlements. There are no illegal settlements in Israel, folks. Ending military trade and free trade agreements, as well as suspending Israel's membership in international forums such as UN bodies, and FIFA. Well, you know what, folks? A <clears throat> hundred years ago, there was a meeting that took place in San Remo, Italy. And at this meeting, four allied nations France, Britain, Russia, and Italy determined the boundary lines of Israel and they wrote down all this information in a mandate called the Mandate for Palestine and in 1922 these four allied nations and then two years later 
us, America, we all accepted this mandate for Palestine. And when that mandate was accepted and ratified by those four allied nations and us, two years later, it became international law and included in that mandate for Palestine was the Balfour Declaration. And when they included the Balfour Declaration in the mandate for Palestine, it too became international law. And you know, that mandate for Palestine has never been null and voided, which means it's still international law. All the land in Israel, from the most southern tip to, to the most northern tip, is all Israeli land. None of it belongs to anybody else. You know, and if anybody else, you know, if anyone says something different, they're lying. Because international law has already established this. See, the reason people get so hung up on listening to the Palestinians, their lies, is because they don't know the truth. They don't study their Israeli history. Maybe they don't study any history. And also, too, those boundary lines were established on the Bible. That's right. They were established on the boundary lines in the Old Testament from Dan to Beersheba. That kept coming up over and over and over again. See, a lot of these people that were sitting in on these meetings, they were Bible-believing Christians. They knew what they were talking about. They wanted to establish a homeland for the Jewish people and for the Jewish people only. They were dealing with the Arab nations, but that was a separate thing. And I'll tell you something else. In order to distinguish Israel from the rest of the Middle Eastern nations, they did give Israel a name because remember, Israel was not yet a nation. So guess what they called it? They called it Palestine. But they knew that name would eventually be dropped when the Jews came back into their land. And indeed, the name was dropped. When was it dropped? On May 14, 1948, when David Ben Garion declared that the land of Israel was going to be called Israel. It was no longer Palestine. And let me tell you something else. That name Palestine, that's a made up name, folks. In 135 AD, some Roman official, his name was Hadrian. I don't remember if he was a general or whatever he was. But listen, he went back to Israel and in his ungodly mind, right? His, in his heathen mind, in his heathen thinking mind, he decided to call Israel Palestina, which is where the word Palestine comes from. And the reason he decided to call Israel Palestina, I mean, this is truly heathen thinking, right? He thought if he just renamed Israel Palestina, that it would forever keep the Jews out of Israel or ever have them return again. Now, how stupid is that? God hundreds of years before had already determined Israel's destiny and no heathen thinking Roman was going to change that and no one else is either not the BDS movement and not the students for justice of Palestine both heathen groups and BDS remember I told you about that boycott in 34 
Well, that's what they're basing this on. They're nothing but neo-Nazis. Modern day neo-Nazis. Because that's where they got the idea from. Now let me read you about the Students for Justice of Palestine, another group that truly gets his ideas from the devil. Okay, so this is some of the things that you have to know about Students for Justice of Palestine, another group who comes out of the pit of hell. The Students for Justice of Palestine Network serves as the leading student arm of, get this, VDS. Here in the United, they serve here in the United States. By the way, 30, 30 um, states have already passed anti-BDS bills. So what does that tell you folks about the BDS movement? They're dangerous. They're anti-Christian. They're anti-Zion. And that's why these bills are being passed. To stop these people. I think a lot of, and the reason, I think the other reason is, is because a lot of people have complained about them infiltrating college and university campuses and poisoning students' minds with their hellish doctrine. SJP is not, as they claim, a grassroots student organization. Now, now listen to what it is. It is a terror-affiliated, anti-Semitic network that currently operates with autonomy and impunity at colleges and universities across the United States. SJP has adapted a policy of anti-normalization of relations with Zionist groups and most Jewish organizations with the exception of the equally radical anti-Zionist and pro-BDS Jewish Voice for Peace. Students for Justice in Palestine advances their proprietary view of Palestinian justice by undertaking initiatives to isolate, demonize, and ultimately destroy the state of Israel. Just like the Palestinians, folks. They're always demonizing Israel. They're always villainizing Israel. When it's the Palestinians that are the villains. They're always taking Jewish history and twisting it around. Just like what Haman did. And making it say what it doesn't mean. And yet these, these mindless buffoons at the UN believe all this. And I hate to admit it, but so do a lot of people in church. They're just as mindless as those buffoons in the UN. Because they go along, not only with Students for Justice of Palestine, but they go along with the BDS movement calling for Israel's destruction. And yet they claim they're Christians. Now, you show me any verse in the Bible without taking it out of context and twisting it around where it shows me where we're supposed to hate Israel? Really? Are we? Because I thought Genesis 12, 3 said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. So if God is saying we're supposed to bless Israel and then you say, oh no, we're supposed to hate the Jews and the land of Israel isn't theirs. Well, you know what you're calling God? You're calling God a liar. 
because God has already said in his word who the land of Israel belongs to and it also does not say we're supposed to hate our Jewish brothers and sisters and let me tell you folks if you do if you go along with the BDS movement and Students for Justice of Palestine you you are not pleasing to God as a matter of fact you are an enemy of God there's this church here in Los Angeles and one day I got into a very heated discussion with somebody at this church and he was very pro-Palestinian and you can tell he, he just hated Israel and yet he, he claims he's a Christian reads the Bible well I got news for you if you hate Israel you hate God you are not a friend of God the same person also claimed that Jesus was a Palestinian well that's very interesting because that word did not come about until uh, let me see well the word Palestina didn't come into existence until oh say about 105 years after Christ had already been crucified buried and resurrected so how, how could Jesus possibly be a Palestinian hmm? no he can't be what does the Bible say in the book of John he came unto his own and his own received him not who's his own the Jewish people Jesus was born in a Jewish town he grew up in a Jewish town he went all over Israel ministering for three years he never left Israel his mother was Jewish his father was Jewish need I go on how many times did Jesus go to Jerusalem let me see the last time I looked on a map I I I thought Jerusalem was right there in Israel but well you know what maybe I'm wrong maybe it's in some Middle Eastern country but can't you see folks people are so twisted when it comes to Israel they can't think straight because the simple truth is is because I don't think they're reading their Old Testament and if they are they're not reading it right okay they're, they're, they're listening to so many of the lies out there of the enemy rather than paying attention to what's here in their Bible. That's the whole problem. They're just like Haman. They take the truth, they twist it around, and that's what starts all this hatred in the church for Israel. Because you got pastors week after week who, who preach nothing but a poison, poisonous, anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist doctrine. And the Bible does not support that. Let's go on. One more point. Many students and university administrations have treated Students for Justice of Palestine as a pro-Palestinian equivalent to pro-Israeli student groups such as Stand With Us, the Israel on Campus Coalition, or Hillel. However, as this monograph documents, SJ, SJP is an extremist organization that maintains affiliations with Arab and Islamic terrorist groups is overly anti-Semitic, incites hatred, boy, they certainly do, man, and violence against Jewish students, they certainly do. Just watch any video on YouTube made by these people at college campuses and universities, and that's exactly what they do. And rejects the existence of the State of Israel in any border just like the Palestinians hey it's all right if Israel exists we just don't want a Jewish presence there none of those 20 Arab nations do 
They don't care if Israel's there. Just don't have any Jew there. We'll accept the nation without Jews, but hell, those Jews? Ah, oh, we can't accept that. So you know what they did? In 1967, a few months after, they lost the Six Day War, and they went home. Uh, they went home running with their tails between their legs. They met a few months later in, in a Sudan Khartoum. Several Arab nations got together and signed what's called the Khartoum Resolution. And this is what it says. No peace with Israel, no negotiations with Israel, and no recognition of Israel. And you know what folks? They've been living by that standard even before 1967. Yeah, we don't care if Israel's there, but we just don't want those Jews there. That's why they're so determined to wipe out every last Jew in Israel because they don't want a Jewish population there. And this is why the peace process doesn't go anywhere because they live by these mindless three points plus they live by that mindless PLO charter over half of which calls for the destruction of Israel. And these people subscribe to all of that. These students for justice of Palestine. <laughs> Why? Because they're just like them. Okay. Last point. SJP has been linked to terror groups. Some have defined SJP as a campus front for Hamas, another terrorist group, at University of California, Berkeley. Principal backers of SJP include founders, financial patrons, and ideological supporters who have been connected to Islamic terror organizations such as Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the Marxist Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Wow, what a group. Just like Haman. I guess you could say Haman... Mm, I guess you could say he was the first terrorist. But actually, this wasn't the first time that someone tried to um, destroy Israel. Uh, Pharaoh did. Remember, he ordered the death of all baby boys. He was another anti-Semitic. Yeah, he ordered the death of all baby boys by having them thrown into the Nile because he didn't want these boys to grow up and join Israel, um, uh, Egypt's enemies and try to overthrow Egypt and win their freedom by overthrowing the country. So he ordered all baby boys to be thrown into the Nile. He was another terrorist trying to destroy Israel. But here, now here comes Haman, another terrorist. And he doesn't have he doesn't have the help of, 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 of the entire nation. Now, he does have the king's backing. All right. Now, he, if he had eventually succeeded in carrying out his plans, I'm sure the king gladly would have given him all the men he needed. But right now, Haman is pretty much acting alone. He's just initiating this holocaust. But we're going to see what happens later on. Okay, folks, let me go back to the book of Esther. I just wanted to point out how devilish, how evil BDS and the Students for Justice of Palestine really are.
All right, let's go back. Verse 10. This is after Haman has lied to the king, you know. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. And the Bible's very clear here, folks, that Haman is an enemy of the Jews. Just like I told you, if you're anti-Zionist, if you're anti-Semitic, if you hate the Jews, not only are you an enemy of the Jews, but you are an enemy of God. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as it seems good to you. So in other words, I'm just going to give you all this money, do whatever you want with it. Murder these people. Well, he didn't say exactly murder. But take care of these people in any way you see fit. Isn't that what Hitler did? He tried to destroy Europe's Jew, Jewish population by any way he saw fit. And he almost succeeded, but he didn't. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded. And, well, you're going to see that it's a really rough decree. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province, according to the script, and to every people in their language. So this command is going to be written in everyone's language so they understand what's going on. In the name of King Yahaziwaras, it is written and sealed with the king's signet ring. Remember, when, when, a, when a commandment was written and sealed by the king's signet ring, it could never be changed or altered no matter what and the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy now get this notice I'm gonna to destroy to kill and to annihilate boy talk about getting to the point but that's how it was back in those days when they wanted to make a point about something, they would use different words to emphasize the same meaning. So what did he say here? To destroy, kill, and annihilate. Hey folks, let me ask you a question. What does the devil come to do? Doesn't he come to kill, rob, and destroy? Isn't that what he... Isn't that what this decree is saying? Hey man, kill, annihilate, and destroy. Just like the devil. Because that's who Haman was serving. That's who the BDS is serving. And the Students for Justice of Palestine. They're, they're all serving the devil. And if you hate the Jewish people, if you think anti-Zionism and and anti-Semitism is of God, then you are of the devil too. And if you support the BDS movement and Students for Justice of Palestine, and you see nothing wrong with what they're doing, then you are an enemy of God. You are not God's friend. God does not wink at this, folks. Just like he doesn't wink at any of our sins. But here, when you blatantly go against his word like that, you are an enemy of God. It says here, And who are they to destroy here? All the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, 
and to plunder their possessions. Verse 14, a copy of the document was to be issued as law. Get this, as law, folks. That means you had to do what it said because it was a commandment by the king. 14, a copy of the document was issued as law in every province being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command. In other words, man, the king just wasn't wasting any time. He just wanted to get rid of these people because Haman had so poisoned his mind, twisting everything out of context, that the king, I think he was just thinking, man, I can hardly wait to get rid of these people. I mean, if that, if they're, if, if they're the way that Haman is describing them, I don't need these people. I don't need unloyal subjects. And the, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Now who was perplexed? Well, certainly not those heathen. No, it was the Jewish people living in Shushan. That would include Mordecai. All right. Now Esther didn't know anything about this, but we're going to find out next week. Until then, God bless you. Shalom. Remember, pray for the peace of Jerusalem.